Chapter Ten of the Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Night at Dark Cedars. Mary Louise sat in the waiting room of the Riverside Hospital, idly looking at the magazines, while the nurses took Miss Grant to her private room. She couldn't help smiling a little as she thought how vexed the old lady would be at the bill she would get. Corrine Pearson had carelessly told the hospital to have one of the best rooms in readiness for the patient. But, if she had her own way, Miss Grant would be in a ward, thought Mary Louise. However, it was too late now to dispute over details. The head nurse came into the waiting room and spoke to Mary Louise in a soft voice. "'Miss Matilda Grant is your aunt, I suppose, Miss?' she asked. "'Gay,' supplied Mary Louise. "'No, I'm not any relation. Just a friend. Of her niece.' "'Oh!' I see. Yes, I know your father, Miss Gay. He's a remarkable man. Mary Louise smiled. I think so, too, she said. As you no doubt expected, continued the nurse, an operation is absolutely necessary. The nurses are getting Miss Grant ready now. Has she consented? Yes, she had to. It is certain death if the surgeon doesn't operate immediately. But before she goes under the anesthetic, she wants to see you. So please come with me. A little surprised at the request, Mary Louise followed the nurse through the hall of the spotless hospital to the elevator and thence to Miss Grant's room. The old lady was lying in a white bed, a tiered in a plain, high-necked nightgown, which the hospital provided. Her face was deathly pale, but her black eyes were as bright as ever, and she smiled at Mary Louise as she entered the room. With her wrinkled hand, she beckoned the girl to a chair beside the bed. "'You're a good girl, Mary Louise,' she said, "'and I trust you.' Mary Louise flushed a trifle at the praise. She didn't know exactly what to say, so she kept quiet and waited. "'Will you do something for me?' asked the old lady. "'Yes, of course, Miss Grant,' replied Mary Louise. "'If I can.' "'I want you to live at Dark Cedars while I'm here in the hospital. Take Jane with you if you want to, and your dog too, but plan to stay there.' "'I can't be there every minute, Miss Grant. Tomorrow I've promised to go to a picnic.' "'Oh, that's all right. I remember now you told me. Take Elsie with you.' but go back to Dark Cedars at night. Sleep in my room, and shut the door. Mary Louise looked puzzled. She could not see the reason for such a request. But there isn't anything valuable for anyone to steal now, is there, Miss Grant? She inquired. You put your money and your bonds in the bank today. The sick woman gasped for breath, and for a moment she could not speak. Finally, she said, you heard about last night from Hannah, and saw the way things were upset? "'Yes, but if burglars didn't take anything, they won't be likely to return, will they?' Miss Grant closed her eyes. "'It wasn't common burglars,' she said. Mary Louise started. Did Miss Grant believe in Hannah's theory about the ghosts? "'You don't mean—I don't know what I mean,' answered the old lady. "'Somebody, living or dead, is trying to get hold of something very precious to me.' "'What is it, Miss Grant?' demanded Mary Louise eagerly. Oh, perhaps now she was getting close to the real mystery at Dark Cedars, for that petty theft by Corrine Pearson was only a side issue, she felt sure. The old lady shook her head. I can't tell. Even you, Mary Louise. Nobody. Then how can I help you? You can watch Elsie, and try to find out where she hid my box of gold pieces. You can keep your eye open for trouble at night, and let me know if anything happens. Will you do it, Mary Louise? I'll ask Mother— at least, if you'll let me tell her all about what has happened. It won't get around Riverside. Mother is used to keeping secrets, you know, for my father is a detective, and if she consents, I'll go and stay with Elsie till you come home. Tears of gratitude stood in the sick woman's eyes. The promise evidently meant a great deal to her. Yes, tell your mother, she said, and Jane's mother, but nobody else. Mary Louise stood up. I must go now, Miss Grant. Your nurse has been beckoning to me for the last two minutes. You have to rest but I'll come in to see you on Sunday. She walked out of the room, closing the door softly behind her, and thinking how sad it must be to face an operation all alone, with no one's loving kiss on your lips, no one's hopes and prayers to sustain you. But, sorry as Mary Louise was for Miss Grant, she could not show her any affection. She couldn't forget or forgive her cruelty to Elsie. Her mother was waiting for her on the porch when she arrived at her house. "'You must be starved, Mary Louise!' she exclaimed. I have your lunch all ready for you. Thanks heaps, mother. I am hungry. But so much has happened. Did Jane tell you about Miss Grant? Yes, but I can't see why you had to go to the hospital with her when she has all those relatives to look after her. 
Mary Louise shrugged her shoulders. They don't like her, mother, and consequently she doesn't trust them. Do you like her? inquired Mrs. Gay. No, I don't, but in a way I feel sorry for her. Mary Louise followed her mother into the dining room and for the next fifteen minutes gave herself up to the enjoyment of the lovely lunch of dainty sandwiches and refreshing iced tea, which her mother had so carefully prepared. It was not until she had finished that she began her story of the robbery at Dark Cedars and of her own and Jane's part in the partial recovery of the money. She made no mention, however, of the bandit who had tried to hold them up or of the queer disturbances at night at Dark Cedars. She concluded with the old lady's request that they, Mary Louise and Jane, stay with Elsie and watch her. Mrs. Gay looked a little doubtful. I don't know, dear, she said. Something might happen. Still, if Mrs. Patterson is willing to let Jane go, I suppose I will say yes. Fifteen minutes later, Mary Louise whistled for her chum and put the proposition up to her. Jane shivered. I'm not going to stay in that spooky old place, she protested. Not after what happened there last night. Who's afraid of the big bad wolf, teased Mary Louise. Jane, I thought you had more sense. There's something uncanny about Dark Cedars, Mary Lou, and you know it. Not just that the house is old and the boards creak and there aren't any electric lights. There's something evil there. Of course there is, but that's the very reason it thrills me. I don't agree with Miss Grant and just want to go there because I believe Elsie is guilty of stealing that gold and that maybe we can find out where she has hidden it. Somebody else took it, I'm sure, and that somebody keeps coming back to Dark Cedars to get something else. Something valuable. Precious to me, Miss Grant called it. And we've got to catch them. You didn't tell your mother that. No, I told her about only what has actually been stolen so far. No need to alarm her. And will you do the same with your mother? Jane rose reluctantly. I suppose so. If you've made up your mind to go through with it, you'll do it. I know you well enough for that. And I don't want you to go over there at Dark Cedars alone, or only with Elsie. Even Hannah and William are moving out, you remember? Yes, I'll go, if Mother will let me. You're a peach, Jane, cried her chum joyfully. It was several hours, however, before the girls actually started to Dark Cedars. Arrangements for the picnic the following day had to be completed, their suitcases had to be packed, and their boyfriends called on the telephone. It was after five o'clock when they were finally ready. From the porch of Mary Louise's house, they saw Max Miller drive up in his car. I'm taking you over, he announced, for Mary Louise had told him that she and Jane were visiting Elsie Grant for a few days. That's nice, Max, replied Mary Louise. We weren't so keen about carrying these suitcases in all this heat. It is terribly hot, isn't it? remarked Mrs. Gay. I'm afraid there will be a thunderstorm before the day is over. Jane made a face. Dark Cedars was gloomy enough without a storm to make it seem worse. Come on, Silky, called Mary Louise. We're taking you this time. I'll say we are, exclaimed her chum emphatically. Elsie Grant was delighted to see them. She came running from behind the hedge attired in her pink linen dress and her white shoes. Mary Louise was thankful that Max did not see her in the old purple calico. His sense of humor might have got the better of him and brought forth a wisecrack or two. As soon as they were out of the car, she introduced them to each other. You didn't know we were coming for a visit, did you, Elsie? She inquired. Well, I'll tell you how it happened. Your Aunt Maddie is in the hospital for an operation, and she wanted Jane and me to stay with you while she was away. The girl wrinkled her brows. It doesn't sound like Aunt Maddie, she said, to be so thoughtful of me. She must have some other motive besides pity for my loneliness. She has, cried Jane. You can be sure. Mary Louise put her finger to her lips. We'll tell you all about it later, she whispered while Max was getting the suitcases from the rumble seat. It's quite a story. Is Hannah still here? inquired Jane, or do we cook our own supper? Yes, she's here, answered Elsie. She expects to come every day to work in the house, and William will take care of the garden and the chickens and milk the cow just the same, but they're going away every night after supper. Max, overhearing the last remark, looked disapproving. You don't mean to tell me you three girls will be here alone every night, he demanded. You're at least half a mile from the nearest house. Oh, don't worry, Max, we'll be all right returned Mary Louise lightly. There's a family of colored people who live in a shack down in the valley behind the house. We can call on them if it's necessary. Speaking of them, remarked Elsie, reminds me that William says half a dozen chickens must have been stolen last night. At least, they're missing, and of course he blames Abraham Lincoln Jones. But I don't believe it. 
Mr. Jones is a deacon in the Riverside Color Church, and his wife is the kindest woman. I often stop in to see her, and she gives me gingerbread. Mary Louise and Jane exchanged significant looks. Perhaps this colored family was the explanation of the mysterious disturbances about Dark Cedars. Mary Louise suggested this to Elsie after Max had driven away with the promise to call for the girls at nine o'clock the following morning. I don't think so, said Elsie, but of course it's possible. Let's walk over to see this family after supper, put in Jane. We might learn a lot. All right, agreed Elsie, if a storm doesn't come up to stop us. Now, come on upstairs and unpack. What room are you going to sleep in? Hannah's or Aunt Maddie's? Or up in the attic with me? We have to sleep in your Aunt Maddie's bedroom, replied Mary Louise. I promised we would. Elsie looked disappointed. You'll be so far away from me, she exclaimed. Why don't you sleep on the second floor, too? inquired Jane. There isn't any room that's furnished as a bedroom, except Hannah's, and I think she still has her things in that. Besides, Aunt Maddie wouldn't like it. Oh, well, we'll leave our door open, promised Jane. No, we can't do that either, asserted Mary Louise. Miss Grant told me to close it. Good gracious, exclaimed her chum. What next? Supper's ready, called Hannah from the kitchen. So that's next, laughed Mary Louise. Well, we'll unpack after supper. I'm not very hungry. I had lunch so late, but I guess I can eat. Hannah came into the dining room and sat down in a chair beside the window while the girls ate their supper so that she might hear the news of her mistress. Mary Louise told everything. The capture of the bills, the part Harry Grant played in the affair, and Corrine Pearson's guilt in the actual stealing. She went on to describe Miss Grant's collapse and removal to the Riverside Hospital, concluding with her request that the two girls stay with Elsie while she was away. "'So she still thinks I stole her gold pieces,' cried the orphan miserably. "'I'm afraid she does, Elsie,' admitted Mary Louise. "'But there's something else she's worrying about. What could Miss Grant possibly own, Hannah, that she's afraid of losing?' "'I don't know for sure,' replied the servant. "'But I'll tell you what I think, if you won't laugh at me.' "'Of course we won't, Hannah,' promised Jane. "'Well, there was something years ago that old Mr. Grant got hold of, something valuable, that I made out didn't belong to him. I don't know what it was. Never did know, but I'd hear Mrs. Grant. That was Miss Maddie's mother, you understand, trying to get him to give it back. It can't do us no good, she'd say, or words like them. And he'd always tell her that he meant to keep it for a while. If they lost everything else, this possession would keep him out of the poorhouse for a spell. Mrs. Grant kept asking him whereabouts it was hidden, and he just laughed at her. I believe she died without ever finding out. Well, whatever it was, Mr. Grant must have given it to Miss Maddie when he died, and she kept it hid somewheres in this house. No ordinary place, or I'd have found it in house cleaning. You can't house clean for forty years, twice at a year, without knowing about everything in a house. But I never seen nothing valuable outside that safe of hern. So what I think it is, continued Hannah, keeping her eyes fixed on Mary Louise, that Mrs. Grant can't rest in her grave till that thing is give back to whoever it belongs to. I believe her spirit visits this house at night, looking for it, and turning things upside down to find it. That's why nothing ain't never stolen. So anybody that lives here ain't going to have no peace at nights till she finds it. Hannah stopped talking, and, as Jane had promised, nobody laughed. As a matter of fact, nobody felt like laughing. The woman's belief in her explanation was too sincere to be derided. The girl sat perfectly still, forgetting even to eat, thinking solemnly of what she had told them. We'll have to find out what the thing is, announced Mary Louise finally. If we expect to make any headway, I wish I could go see Miss Maddie at the hospital tomorrow. Well, you can't, said Jane firmly. We're going to that picnic. We can ask the gypsies when we have our fortunes told. Gypsies, exclaimed Hannah scornfully. Gypsies ain't no good. They used to camp around here till they drove Miss Maddie wild and she got the police after them. Don't have nothing to do with gypsies. We are just going to have our fortunes told, explained Jane. We don't expect to invite them to our houses. Well, don't, was the servant's warning as she left the room. When the girls had finished their supper, they went upstairs to Miss Grant's bedroom and unpacked their suitcases. But they were too tired to walk down the hill to call upon Abraham Lincoln Jones. If he wanted to steal chickens tonight, he was welcome to as far as they were concerned. Hannah and William left about eight o'clock, locking the kitchen door behind them and the girls stayed out on the front porch until ten, talking and singing to Jane's ukulele. The threatening storm had not arrived when they finally went to bed. 
It was so still, so hot outdoors, that not even a branch moved in the darkness. The very silence was oppressive. Jane was sure that she wouldn't be able to go to sleep when she got into Miss Maddie's wooden bed with its ugly carving on the headboard. But, in spite of the heat, both girls dropped off in less than five minutes. They were awakened some time after two by a loud clap of thunder. Branches of the trees close to the house were lashing against the windows, and the rain was pouring in. Mary Louise jumped up to shut the window. As she crawled back into bed, she heard footsteps in the hall. Light footsteps, scarcely perceptible above the rain. But someone, something, was stealthily approaching their door. Her instinct was to reach for the electric light button when she remembered that Miss Grant used only oil lamps. Trembling, she groped in the darkness for her flashlight on the chair beside her. But before she found it, the handle rattled on the door, and it opened, slowly and quietly. There, dimly perceptible in the blackness of the hall, stood a figure, all in white. End of chapter 10《Chapter Eleven of the Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Picnic The figure in white remained motionless in the doorway of Miss Grant's room. Mary Louise continued to sit rigid in the bed, while Jane, who was still lying down, clutched her chum's arm with a grip that actually hurt. For a full minute there was no sound in the room. Then a flash of lightning revealed the cause of the girl's terror. Mary Louise burst out laughing. Elsie, she cried, you certainly had us scared. Jane sat up angrily. What's the idea, sneaking in like a ghost, she demanded. The orphan started to sob. I was afraid of waking you, she explained. I didn't mean to frighten you. Well, it's all right now, said Mary Louise soothingly. Ordinarily, we shouldn't have been scared. But in this house, where everybody talks about seeing ghosts all the time, it's natural for us to be keyed up. Why that woman doesn't put in electricity, muttered Jane, is more than I can see. It's positively barbarous. Come over and sit here on the bed, Elsie, and tell us why you came downstairs, invited Mary Louise. Are you afraid of the storm? Yes, a little bit, but I thought I heard something down in the yard. Old Mrs. Grant's ghost? inquired Jane lightly. Maybe it was Abraham Lincoln Jones, returning for more chickens, surmised Mary Louise. But no, it couldn't be, or Silky would be barking. He could hear that from the cellar. So it must be just the wind, Elsie. It does make an uncanny sound through all the trees. May I stay here till the storm is over? asked the girl. Certainly. If it had not been so hot, Mary Louise would have told Elsie to sleep with them. But three in a bed, and a rather uncomfortable bed at that, was two close quarters on a night like this. The storm lasted for perhaps an hour, while the girls sat chatting together. As the thundering subsided, Jane began to yawn. Suppose I go up to the attic and sleep with Elsie, she said to Mary Louise, if you're not afraid to stay in this room by yourself. Of course I'm not, replied her chum. I think that's a fine idea, and your being there will prevent Elsie from being nervous and hearing things. Does it suit you, Elsie? Yes, I'd love it. If you're sure you don't mind, Mary Louise. I don't expect to mind anything in about five minutes, yawned Mary Louise. I'm dead for sleep. She was correct in her surmise. She knew nothing at all until the bright sunshine was pouring into her room, and Jane wakened her by throwing a pillow at her head. Wake up, lazy bones, she cried. Don't you realize that today is the picnic? Mary Louise threw the pillow back at her chum and jumped out of bed. What a glorious day, she exclaimed, and so much cooler. Elsie, attired in her new pink linen dress, dashed into the room. Oh, this is something like, she cried. I haven't heard any gaiety like this for three years. Mary Louise is always gay, remarked Jane demurely. In fact, she'll be gay till she gets married. Her chum hurled the other pillow from Miss Grant's bed, just as Hannah poked her nose into the room. Don't you girls throw them pillows around she commanded. Miss Maddie is that careful about her bed. She even makes it herself, and at house clean and time I ain't allowed to touch it. It's a wonder she let you sleep on it, Mary Louise, observed Elsie. Made me sleep on it, you mean. Then, of Hannah, she inquired, how soon do we have breakfast? Right away, soon as you're dressed, 
Then you girls can help pack up some donuts and rolls I made for your picnic. You're an angel, Hannah, exclaimed Mary Louise. To the girls, she said, scram if you want me downstairs in two minutes. Soon after breakfast, the cars arrived. There were three of them, the two sports roadsters belonging to Max Miller and Norman Wilder, and a sedan driven by one of the girls of their crowd, a small, red-headed girl named Hope Dorsey, who looked like Janet Gaynor. Max had brought an extra boy for Elsie, a junior at high school by the name of Kenneth Dormer, and Mary Louise introduced him, putting him with Elsie in Max's rumble seat. She herself got into the front. "'Got your swimming suit, Mary Lou?' asked Max, as he started his car with its usual sudden leap. "'Of course,' she replied. "'As a matter of fact, I brought two of them.' I hadn't noticed you were getting that fat. That's just about enough out of you. I don't admire the Mae West figure, you know. Then why two suits? inquired the young man. Change of costume? One for Elsie and one for me, explained Mary Louise. I don't believe Elsie can swim, but she'll soon learn. Will you teach her, Max? I don't think I'll get a chance to, from the way I saw Ken making eyes at her. He'll probably have a monopoly on the teaching. Mary Louise smiled. This was just the way she wanted things to be. The picnic grounds near Cooper's Woods were only a couple of miles from Riverside. A wide stream which flowed through the woods had been dammed up for swimming, and here the boys and men of Riverside had built two rough shacks for dressing houses. The cars were no sooner unloaded than the boys and girls dashed for their respective bathhouses. "'Last one in the pool is a monkey!' called Max as he locked his car. "'I guess I'll be the monkey,' remarked Elsie, "'because I have a suit I'm not familiar with.' "'I'll help you,' offered Mary Louise." They were dressed in no time at all. As usual, the girls were ahead of the boys. They were all in the water by the time the boys came out of their shack. The pool was empty except for a few children, so the young people from Riverside had a chance to play water games and to dive to their heart's content. Everybody except Elsie Grant knew how to swim, and Mary Louise and several of the others were capable of executing some remarkable stunt diving. Before noontime arrived, Elsie found herself venturing into the deeper parts of the pool, and, with Kenneth or Mary Louise beside her, she actually swam several yards. All the while she was laughing and shouting, as she had not done since her parents' death. The cloud of suspicion that had been hanging over her head for the past few days was forgotten. She was a normal, happy girl again. The lunch that followed provided even more fun and hilarity than the swim. It seemed as if their mothers had supplied everything in the world to eat. Cakes and pies and sandwiches hot dogs and steaks to be cooked over the fire which the boys built, ice cream and dry ice, and refreshing drinks of fruit juices, iced tea, and soda water. Keen as their appetites were from the morning swim, the young people could not begin to eat everything they had brought. "'We'll have enough left for supper,' said Mary Louise, leaning back against a tree trunk with a sigh of content. "'If the ants don't eat it up,' returned Jane, "'we better cover things up.' "'We'll do it right away,' announced Hope Dorsey." Come on, boys, you burn rubbish and we girls will pack food. I can't move, protested Max. The ants are welcome to their share as far as I'm concerned. I don't think I'll ever eat again. I hate ants, said Elsie with a sly look at Mary Louise and Jane. I don't want them to get a thing, so I'll help put the food away. Max and a couple of the other lazier boys were pulled to their feet by Kenneth and Norman, and the picnic spot was soon as clean as when the party had arrived. Hope Dorsey suggested that they drive back to her home later in the afternoon and have supper on the lawn. Then they could turn on the radio and dance on her big screened porch. "'When do we visit these gypsies you were talking about, Max?' demanded Jane. "'I'm keen to hear my fortune.' "'They're back towards Riverside,' replied the youth. "'About half a mile from Dark Cedars,' he added to Mary Louise. "'They used to camp at Dark Cedars. At least, some gypsies did,' Elsie informed the party. "'If they're the same ones,' You'd think they wouldn't come back after they were driven away by the police. Is that what your aunt did? inquired Kenneth. Yes, so Hannah says. Hannah is the maid, you know. She says Aunt Mattie hates them. The young people piled into the cars again, and Max led the way, off the main highway to a dirt road extending behind dark cedars. Through the trees they could catch a glimpse of the gypsy encampment. Has everybody some money? In silver? inquired Max after the cars were parked beside the road. The gypsies insist on gold and silver. Mary Louise nodded. She was prepared for herself as well as for Elsie. Do we all go in a bunch? asked Hope. Certainly not, replied Max. You don't think we could tell our secrets in front of the whole bunch, do you? 
must be pretty bad observed jane all right then if that's the way you feel about it i'll go in with you challenged norman suits me returned the girl with a wink at mary louise as the crowd came closer to the gypsy encampment they saw the usual tents the caravans which was a motor truck and a fire over which a kettle was smouldering half a dozen children dressed in ordinary clothing but without shoes and stockings were playing under a tree and there were several women about but there did not appear to be any men at the camp at the time one of the women who had been standing over the fire came forward to meet the young people she was past middle age mary louise judged from her dark wrinkled skin but her hair was jet black and her movements were as agile and as graceful as a girl's she wore a long dress of a deep blue color without any touch of the reds and yellows one usually associates with gypsies fortunes she asked smiling and revealing an ugly gap in her front teeth which made her look almost like a storybook witch how much asked max holding up a quarter in his hand the gypsy shook her head one dollar she announced max pulled down the corners of his mouth and looked doubtfully at his friends there are fourteen of us he said fourteen at fifty cents each is seven dollars all in silver take it or leave it the woman regarded him shrewdly she saw that he meant what he said all right she agreed i'll go into my tent and get ready the young people turned to max with whispered congratulations she certainly speaks perfect english remarked mary louise they sat down on the grass while they waited for the gypsy woman to summon them and when the tent flap finally opened jane patterson and norman wilder jumped to their feet and walked over to the fortune teller first she'll think you two are engaged jane teased hope if you go in together then she'll get fooled returned the other girl laughingly the couple were absent for perhaps five minutes when they came out of the tent jane dashed down the hill to the road the gypsy told her that her class ring is in my car explained norman to the others the one she lost you remember she said it's under the seat i could have suggested that she look there myself remarked max only i thought of course that she already had shall i try my luck next or will one of you girls go i'd love to go offered hope dorsey i simply can't wait by the way did she think you two were engaged no she didn't she's pretty wise after all she told me some astounding things one was that a relation had just died my uncle did you know and that we're going to get some money i hope that part's true you have to hand it to her i don't believe it's all just the bunk hope ran into the tent and while she was gone jane returned triumphantly from the car with her lost ring mary louise's eyes flashed with excitement perhaps the gypsy was really possessed of second sight oh if she could only solve the mystery at dark cedars mary louise was last of all the group to enter the fortune teller's tent the woman was seated on the ground with a dirty pack of cards in her hands she indicated that the girl should sit down beside her and gave her the cards to shuffle i'm really not interested in my fortune half so much as i am in a mystery i'm involved in explained mary louise she paused wondering whether the gypsy would understand what she was talking about perhaps she ought to use simpler language you mean you want to ask me questions inquired the woman yes that's it replied mary louise i'm staying at dark cedars now and there are strange things going on there maybe you can explain them to me dark cedars repeated the gypsy i know the place you don't live there no i don't live there i'm just staying there while miss grant is in the hospital the black eyes gleamed and the woman held two thin dirty hands in front of her face mattie grant is evil she announced keep away from her mary louise wrinkled her brows i'm not with her she said i'm only staying at dark cedars while miss grant is away but why is that that's just what i want to ask you miss grant's money has already been stolen and i thought maybe you could tell me what i'm supposed to be protecting by sleeping in her bed every night in the old witch's bed oh ho yes it struck mary louise funny that this gypsy woman should call miss grant a witch when she herself looked much more like one the gypsy however was giving her attention to the cards shuffling them and finally drawing one of them out of the deck she laid it face up in mary louise's lap and nodded significantly it was the eight of hearts mattie grant's treasure is a ruby necklace she announced slowly staring hard at the card with eight precious rubies 
She handed the card to Mary Louise. Count them for yourself, she said. Mary Louise gazed at the woman in amazement, not knowing whether to believe her or not. The explanation was plausible, but it seemed rather foolish to her that the eight of hearts should mean eight rubies. Would the ace of diamonds have indicated a diamond ring? But there was no use in questioning the gypsy's power, no point in antagonizing her. So, instead, she changed the subject by telling her that a box of gold pieces had been stolen from the safe in Miss Grant's bedroom. Perhaps you can tell me who took them, she suggested. The woman picked up the cards and shuffled them again, muttering something unintelligible to herself as she did it. Once more she drew out a card, seemingly at random. This time it was the Queen of Diamonds. A light-haired girl, or woman, she announced. That's all I can say. Mary Louise gasped. Elsie Grant had light hair, but then so did Corrine Pearson, and Mrs. Grace Grant's hair was gray. The gypsy rose from the ground as lightly and as easily as a girl. I think you've had more than your time, miss, she concluded. Now, please to go. End of chapter 11《Chapter Twelve of the Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bound and Gagged. How is your fortune, Mary Louise? inquired Max, as the former emerged from the gypsy's tent and joined the merry group in the field. Did she say you'd marry a tall, good looking fellow with lots of personality? Mary Louise laughed. No, she didn't. I guess I'm going to be an old maid. Then you're the only one remarked Hope. All the rest of us get rich husbands and trips around the world. Elsie came up close to Mary Louise and whispered in her ear. She told me to leave Dark Cedars, she said. How do you suppose she knew that I lived there? Must have seen you around, I suppose, replied Mary Louise. She warned me to get out too, but then I told her I was staying there. But don't tell Jane, Elsie. She'd go in a minute if she heard that. Hadn't we better all go? till Aunt Maddie gets back from the hospital? Wouldn't your mother let me stay at your house if I worked for my board? Of course she would. You wouldn't have to work any more than I do, just help mother a little. But I promised your aunt I'd live at her place and sleep in her bed, and I'm going to stay. There's some explanation for all this superstition about dark cedars, and I mean to find it out. Stop whispering secrets, commanded Max Miller, separating the two girls forcibly. Of course, Ken and I know you're talking about us and what you're saying is probably complimentary. Elsie laughed and followed Mary Louise into the car. The group drove to Hope Dorsey's, as she had suggested, and ate the rest of the picnic food for their supper. Another round of fun followed, and it was after ten when the party finally broke up. Dropping Kenneth Dormer at his own home, Max ran the three girls back to Dark Cedars. Don't you think I'd better go into the house and light the lamps for you? He inquired. It looks so spooky in there. Oh, we have Silky for protection returned Mary Louise lightly. Thank you just the same, Max. The young man waited, however, until he saw the girls unlock the front door and light the lamp in the hall. Everything's okay, shouted Mary Louise. We'll be asleep inside of ten minutes. Max waved back again and started his engine. Elsie lighted two more lamps which Hannah had left in readiness for the girls, and all together, with Silky at their heels, they mounted the creaking staircase. You can't sleep upstairs, Silky said Mary Louise to her dog. Miss Grant would never allow that. Go down to your box in the cellar. The spaniel seemed to understand, for he stood still, wagging his tail and looking pleadingly at his mistress. I think it's a shame to send him off by himself, remarked Jane. So do I, agreed Mary Louise, but it's got to be done. He'd get up on the bed as likely as not the way he does at home. And just imagine what Miss Grant would think of that. Her precious bed. Turning about, she led the little dog to the cellar, and there, in a box next to the kittens, he settled down to sleep. When she returned, the girls were waiting for her in Miss Grant's bedroom. "'How do we sleep tonight?' inquired Elsie. "'Oh, you can have Jane again if you want her,' agreed Mary Louise. "'It doesn't make any difference to me.' The younger girl was delighted. "'Only,' added Mary Louise, "'if you expect to do any prowling around tonight, please shout your presence in the room.' I expect to go right to sleep, replied Elsie. With Jane beside me, I'll feel safe. Mary Louise smiled and kissed her goodnight. In many ways, Elsie Grant seemed like a child to her, in spite of her fifteen years. 
Alone in the room, she undressed quickly, hanging her clothing on a chair, for she could not bring herself to use that big old closet filled with Miss Grant's things. She was very tired, and, thankful that the night was so much cooler than the preceding one, she blew out the lamp and crawled into bed. The utter blackness of the room was rather appalling, even to a courageous girl like Mary Louise. Accustomed as she was to the street lights of Riverside, the darkness was thick and strange, for the denseness of the trees about dark cedars shut out even the sky with its stars from the windows. But Mary Louise closed her eyes immediately, resolved not to let anything so trivial bother her. The girls in the attic had quieted down. The house was in absolute silence. Mary Louise, too, lay very still, listening. She almost believed that she heard someone breathing. But that's absurd, she reprimanded herself sharply. It couldn't be a ghost, as Hannah insists, for ghosts don't breathe. And it couldn't be a robber trying to get into the house, or Silky would be barking. That dog has keen ears. She turned over and put the thought out of her mind by recalling the highlights of the picnic, and soon dozed off. But she knew that she had not been asleep long when she was suddenly awakened by the low, squeaking creak of a door. Thinking it was probably Elsie, restless after too much picnic food, Mary Louise opened her eyes and peered about in the darkness. Now she heard that breathing distinctly, and something big and dark seemed to be moving towards her, something blacker than the darkness of the room. No face was visible to her until the figure bent over close to her in the bed. Then she beheld two gleaming eyes. She opened her lips to scream, but at the same instant a thin hand was clapped over her mouth, making utterance impossible. Both her hands were caught and held in an iron grip, and a bag was pulled over her head and tied so tightly under her chin that she believed she would choke. Mary Louise could see nothing now, but she felt a rope being twisted around her body, tying her arms to her sides. In another second she was lifted bodily and tossed roughly into Miss Grant's closet. The key was turned in the lock. In wild desperation Mary Louise tried to shout, but the thickness and tightness of the bag over her head muffled the sound and the closet walls closed it in. The girls in the attic would never hear her, for they were at the back of the house and probably sleeping soundly, so she abandoned the effort and became quiet twisting her hands about under the rope and listening to the sounds from the room. Whoever, whatever it was that had attacked her was moving around stealthily, making a queer noise that sounded like the tearing of a garment. For a brief moment, the thought of Corrine Pearson jumped into her mind. Had the girl come here to get revenge on Mary Louise for disclosing her guilt, and was she tearing her clothes to pieces? But such an explanation was too absurd to be possible. It couldn't be Corrine. She was at that dance with Ned Mason. But it might be Harry Grant, searching for that precious possession of his Aunt Mattie's, that ruby necklace, if the gypsy was correct. But no, Mary Louise did not believe it was Harry, or any man. Something about the motion of the figure, the touch of its hands, proclaimed it to be feminine. She thought of that ghost Hannah had described, the spirit of dead Mrs. Grant, looking for the hidden treasure, and she shuddered. The tearing and ripping was becoming more pronounced. Mary Louise listened more intently, still twisting her hands about in an effort to free them. She heard a chair being moved away from the window, and the screen being taken away. She twisted her hands again. Her right hand was free. In spite of her terror, Mary Louise almost sang out with joy. The next sound she heard was a dear, familiar voice, a sound that sent a thrill through her whole body. It was the infuriated bark of her little dog Silky from the cellar. Mary Louise lost no time in freeing her other hand and in untying the knot about her chin which fastened the bag over her head. She was free at last, as far as her limbs were concerned, but she was still locked securely in Miss Grant's closet. Through the crack of the door she perceived a streak of light. The intruder had not worked in darkness, but in a second it was extinguished and she heard a noise at the window. Then, utter blackness and silence again. Mary Louise raised her voice now and screamed at the top of her lungs. She was rewarded by the sound of hurrying footsteps and the incessant bark of her dog coming nearer and nearer. In another moment she heard the girls in the room and saw the gleam of a flashlight through the crack. "'I'm locked in the closet!' she shouted. "'Let me out, Jane!' Her chum turned the key in the door. Thank heaven it was still there. Blinded by the light from the flash, Mary Louise staggered out. "'What happened?' demanded Jane, her face deathly pale with terror. Mary Louise stumbled towards the bed. 
No bones broken, thank goodness, she exclaimed, sitting down carefully upon the bed. But she jumped up immediately. What's happened to this bed? she demanded. It's full of pins and needles. Her chum turned the flashlight upon the ugly piece of furniture, and Mary Louise perceived at once the explanation of the ripping sound she had heard. The bedclothing was literally torn to pieces. The mattress was cut in a dozen places, and straw strewn all over the floor. No wonder it felt sharp to sit down on. So the ruby necklace was hidden in the bed, she muttered. What ruby necklace? demanded Jane. That's what the gypsy said Miss Grant was treasuring so carefully. She probably just made a guess at it to seem wise. It may be a diamond ring for all I know. Anyhow, somebody stole it. Who could it have been? Tell us exactly what happened, begged Jane. Briefly, Mary Louise told the grim story. Elsie had lighted the lamp and the girls sat about on chairs, listening intently. Silky, who had stopped barking now, climbed into his mistress's lap. Funny Elsie didn't hear you try to scream the first time, remarked Jane. She was awake. You were? asked Mary Louise. What time is it? It's only quarter past eleven, answered Elsie. I couldn't go to sleep. Too much chocolate cake and apple pie, I suppose. It was Silky who waked me up, said Jane. I heard him barking, and I looked for Elsie and saw she wasn't in bed, so I thought he was barking at her, prowling around the house. Mary Louise opened her eyes wide. Where were you, Elsie? I was down in the kitchen, getting some baking soda. She burst into tears. You don't think I did that fiendish thing, do you, Mary Louise? No, of course not. But Mary Louise knew that Miss Grant would not be so ready to accept her niece's innocence. We better make a tour of the house, she suggested, standing up and going over to the window, where she noticed that the screen was out, lying on the floor. I think the intruder must have gotten out this way. But that's not the window with the porch underneath, objected Jane. No, but he could have used a ladder, returned Mary Louise. The girls slipped coats over their pajamas and put on their shoes. With Silky close at their heels, they went downstairs and out the front door, around to the side of the house. The first thing that they spied was a ladder, lying on the ground perpendicular to the wall. That's William's ladder, announced Elsie. He often leaves it around. It seems to me he had it out yesterday, nailing up a board on the porch roof. If only we could find some footprints, said Mary Louise, flashing her light on the ground. But she could see no marks. If the intruder had made off that way, he had been wise enough to walk over the rounds of the ladder. And everywhere cedar needles covered the ground, making footprints almost impossible. Wait till Aunt Mattie hears about this, sobbed Elsie. It'll be the end of me. We won't tell her till she gets better, decided Mary Louise. Maybe by that time we'll discover a clue that will help us solve the mystery. Oh, I hope so, breathed the young girl fervently. All this time, however, Jane said nothing, but she was watching Elsie closely, as if she was beginning to believe that she might be guilty. Let's go to bed, concluded Mary Louise when the tour of the inspection was finished. I'm going to sleep in Hannah's room, and I'm going to keep Silky with me this time. I wish you'd taken that precaution before, sighed Jane. So do I, but it's too late now. Let's get some sleep, for tomorrow we have to get to work, and work fast. End of chapter 12「Chapter Thirteen of the Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Detective Work Sunday morning dawned clear and peaceful. As Mary Louise wakened to hear the birds singing in the trees outside the window of Hannah's old room at Dark Cedars, she could hardly believe in the terrifying experience of the previous night. It was just like a horrible dream, incredible in the morning sunshine. I believe I'd like to go to Sunday school, she said to Jane at the breakfast table. It's a lovely day, and we'd see all our friends. Don't you want to come along too, Elsie? The young girl, still pale and nervous from the night before, shook her head. No, thank you, Mary Louise, she replied. I'll stay home and help Hannah. Mary Louise glanced up apprehensively, as yet the servant had not been informed of the mysterious intruder. Will you tell her what happened last night? she asked in a low tone. Or shall we? No, I will, agreed Elsie. She'll be sure it was Mrs. Grant's ghost again, 
and I'll help her fix up the bedroom. Mary Louise nodded. You'll come, Jane? she inquired. I'm leaving, for good, announced her chum. I wouldn't spend another night at Dark Cedars for all the necklaces in the world. Mary Louise said nothing. There was no use arguing with Jane. As she went out of the door with Silky at her heels, she called to Hannah that she alone would be back for dinner. About two o'clock, returned the woman, and ain't Miss Jane coming? No, Hannah, answered the girl for herself. I shan't see you again. Goodbye. The girls were some distance beyond the hedge of dark cedars when Mary Louise asked her companion her reason for leaving. Because, she added, now that everything valuable has been stolen, I don't see what you have to fear. Jane hesitated a moment. I hate to say it, Mary Lou, but I feel I must tell you, for your own protection. It's Elsie I'm afraid of. I really believe she is guilty. I think she has those gold pieces hidden somewhere at dark cedars, and now the necklace. I think she's a sneak and I believe she's planning a getaway. But if one of us should discover her theft, I'm afraid she'll do something desperate to us. An expression of pain passed over Mary Louise's face. Go on and tell me why you suspect her, she said. On account of last night. Figure it out for yourself. If that had been a burglar, why wouldn't Silky have barked when he was getting into the house? Why wouldn't Elsie have heard him if she was down in the kitchen as she said? And how could he have gotten away so quickly? You think maybe he went out that window at the side of the house, but that's only a guess. Elsie could have pretended to make an escape from the window while you were locked in the closet, and then have slipped out the door and down to the kitchen. Mary Louise gasped in horror. It doesn't sound possible, she admitted. And the way she protested her innocence immediately, added Jane. Remember that? Yes, I do. But there is a possible explanation, Jane. The burglar might have broken into the house while we were away and been hiding in the closet while I got ready for bed. I didn't open the door. But why would he do that? Why wouldn't he finish the job and leave before we came back? He might have just gotten in about the time we arrived at Dark Cedars. She paused, thinking of Corrine Pearson. Suppose it was Corrine, on her way to that dance. Jane shook her head. Possible, but not probable, she said. No, I believe it was Elsie. Do you remember how pleased she was that I wasn't going to sleep with you in Miss Maddie's room? And how she sneaked in there night before last, scaring us so? Oh, Mary Lou, I think all the evidence points that way. And she's beginning to notice our suspicion. That's why she was so quiet at breakfast and so glad to get rid of us. Mary Louise was silent. She did not tell Jane that she felt convinced that the burglar was of the feminine gender. Well, don't say anything about our experience to anybody cautioned Mary Louise as the girls entered the Sunday school building. I may talk it over with Daddy if he's home, but nobody else. Jane promised, and they both dismissed their troubles for the time being in the presence of their friends. It was eleven o'clock when the two girls came out of the building to find Silky patiently waiting for them. You take him home, Jane, said Mary Louise, and I'll stop at the hospital. If I can do so tactfully, I want to find out whether it really was a ruby necklace that was hidden in the bed. But Mary Louise's visit proved a disappointment. She was told at the desk that it would be impossible for her or anyone else to see Miss Maddie Grant at the present time. The operation was successful, the attendant stated, in that matter-of-fact tone officials so often assume. But Miss Grant is under the influence of a narcotic. She wouldn't know anybody. Come back tomorrow. Mary Louise nodded and walked slowly out of the door, uncertain as to what her next move should be. Still thinking deeply, she strolled down the street until she came within a block of Mrs. Grace Grant's home. Here, a sudden impulse decided her to visit these relations of Miss Maddie. If anyone in the world knew about the necklace, that person would be the trusted nephew, John Grant. Mary Louise paused a moment in front of the gate, a little nervous about going in. Suppose Harry Grant were home alone, and he started to tease her in that familiar way of his. John she had never seen, except that night on his porch in the dark, and of course Mrs. Grant would be at church. But the sight of a nice-looking sedan parked in front of the house reassured her. In all probability that was John's car, she decided, for it certainly was not Harry's. Bravely, she opened the gate and walked up to the porch. She had to wait several minutes before there was any answer to her ring. Then a middle-aged man, stout and rather bald, as Elsie had described John, opened the door. Is this Mr. John Grant? she asked, trying to make her tone sound businesslike. Yes, replied the man. I am Mary Louise Gay, she stated, the girl who found Miss Mattie Grant's money for her, you know. 
John Grant did not know. He shook his head. Evidently, the story had been suppressed by his mother out of consideration for Harry. You didn't hear about the robbery? she inquired. No, I only know that Aunt Mattie is in the hospital. My sister, Mrs. Pearson, phoned yesterday. But when was she robbed? Can you come out on the porch and talk to me for a few minutes, Mr. Grant? asked Mary Louise. Certainly, he answered, glancing at his watch. I have to drive to church for mother at half past twelve, but that's over an hour from now. Thank you, Mr. Grant, said Mary Louise, as she seated herself in one of the chairs. I won't tell you the whole story. It's too long. But before your aunt went to the hospital, all her money was stolen out of her safe. My chum and I succeeded in getting most of it back, all but a box of gold pieces, and your aunt put the money and her bonds into the bank. Then, when she had to go to the hospital so suddenly, she became panic-stricken and made me promise to sleep in her room while she was away. She had something hidden in her room, something valuable, but she wouldn't tell me what it was. I'd like to find out just what it was. Why? demanded the man fearfully. Has that been taken too? Mary Louise nodded and briefly told her story of the mysterious intruder the preceding night. It was a ruby necklace, said John. A necklace someone gave to my grandfather, I believe. Aunt Mattie didn't know much about how he got it, but he told her it was very valuable and that she must guard it above everything else in the world. So she had it hidden in her straw mattress and told me where it was because it is will to me. Nobody else knew anything about it, to my knowledge. A ruby necklace? repeated Mary Louise. That's what the gypsy said it was. I asked a fortune teller whom our crowd visited yesterday, and she told me, claimed it was second sight on her part. John Grant laughed. More likely a rumor she had heard. The family knew there was something. I mean, Aunt Mattie's family, my father and my uncle. But even they never knew where Grandfather got it or from whom. There must have been something queer about it, though, for I understood from my father that Grandmother wanted him to give it back. And then, when Aunt Mattie got hold of it, she kept it hidden. Yes, that's what Hannah says, agreed Mary Louise. She says all this disturbance is old Mrs. Grant's spirit trying to get it back again, but I can't be expected to believe that. Naturally, John smiled, and Mary Louise thought what a nice, pleasant face he had. No wonder his Aunt Mattie trusted him. Miss Grant is going to blame Elsie, of course, continued Mary Louise. She accused her of stealing the gold pieces. Hmm, observed John, as he too thought the idea possible. Did she take the rest of the money? No, she didn't. We proved that. Then who did? inquired John. I think I'd better not say, answered Mary Louise. That's over and done with. Your mother knows. If you want, you can ask her. John smiled. Mary Louise believed he had guessed the solution himself. You don't really think Elsie would take the gold or the necklace, do you, Mr. Grant? she asked anxiously. Of course, you know her a lot better than I do. I don't know. She might argue that she had a right to some of that money. It wasn't quite fair that Aunt Mattie got all of Grandfather's fortune, and Elsie's father didn't get a penny. Yes, she might take it, while I don't believe she would ever steal anything else. Mary Louise shuddered. It seemed as if she were the only person in the world who still considered Elsie innocent. There's a colored family who lived down the hill in back of Dark Cedars. Could they know about the necklace, Mr. Grant, do you suppose? Abraham Lincoln Jones? Yes. They could have heard rumors about it, just as those gypsies did. But I happen to know that man, and I am sure he is thoroughly honest. Would he steal chickens? Not even chickens. Of course, his children might. Colored people love chicken, you know. I'm going to get Elsie to take me to see them this afternoon. Mary Louise rose from her chair. I won't take any more of your time, Mr. Grant. Unless you can tell me what to do, I don't like to go to the police without Miss Grant's consent. No, I wouldn't do that. If there's something queer about her possession of the necklace, it would be better for her to lose it than to have an old disgrace exposed. At Aunt Mattie's age, I mean. We better wait until she gets well. Mary Louise nodded. That was exactly her idea, too. Unless, of course, one of the family had taken it, Corrine Pearson or Harry Grant. But I guess it would be all right to speak to Daddy in confidence about it, she said, and get his advice. Your father? Yes, he is Detective Gay of the police force. You've heard of him? Oh, yes, certainly. But tell him not to bring in the police. Yet. Mary Louise held out her hand. Thank you so much, Mr. Grant, for giving me your time, she said. I'll get in touch with you later. Well satisfied with her interview, she left the Grant's porch and determined to do a little more investigating for herself before she consulted her father. 
A little farther down the street was the home of Bernice Tracy, an attractive young woman of about twenty-five who had once been a lieutenant in Mary Louise's Girl Scout troop. To this girl she decided to go for some information concerning Corrine Pearson, for she knew that Miss Tracy was a member of the country club set. Miss Tracy herself answered Mary Louise's ring at the door. "'Why, Mary Lou!' she exclaimed in surprise. "'You are a stranger, and you almost caught me in bed, too. I just finished my breakfast. Come in, or shall I come out on the porch?' "'Oh, I can only stay a minute, Miss Tracy,' replied Mary Louise. "'I just wanted to ask you a couple of questions, if you don't mind. And please don't think I'm crazy.' "'I know there never was a girl with a more level head on her shoulders,' answered the other admiringly. "'Go ahead and ask me the questions, Mary Lou.' "'Well, er, you went to the dance last night, didn't you, with the country club people? Was Corrine Pearson there?' "'Yes. She and Ned Mason ate supper with us. Why?' "'Please don't ask me why. What time did the dance begin?' "'About eleven o'clock.' Mary Louise frowned. It was possible, then, that Corrine could have been at Dark Cedars a little after ten. "'And... And can you remember what Miss Pearson wore? Yes, a white organdy. It was very simple, but awfully nice for a summer dance. I wish I had been as sensible. Now for the final question. Mary Louise had to summon all her courage to put forth this one. Do you remember what kind of jewelry she had on? What color? Miss Tracy's face lighted up with a smile. I know why you're asking me these questions, Mary Lou, she exclaimed. You're a society reporter on the Star, aren't you? But I don't see why you don't ask me what I wore. Aren't I as pretty and as important as Corrine Pearson? You're twice as important and five times as pretty, Miss Tracy, replied Mary Louise instantly. But I'm not a reporter, or even trying to become one. I'll explain some time later. Just tell me about the jewelry, if you can remember. All right, my dear. Corrine wore red with her white dress. Imitation rubies, I suppose. Earrings and necklace and two bracelets. Oh, gasped Mary Louise. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you, Miss Tracy. Thank you just heaps. End of chapter 13「Chapter 14 of The Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Bad News. Mary Louise's first impulse, upon leaving Miss Tracy's home, was to rush right over to Corrine Pearson with a demand to see the necklace which she had worn at the dance the night before. But she had not taken more than a few steps before she saw the foolishness of such a proceeding. In the first place, Corrine would not be likely to show her the necklace. In the second place, Mary Louise could tell nothing by examining it. She wasn't a connoisseur in rubies. It was doubtful whether she could spot a real stone if she saw one. No, nothing was to be gained by a visit to the Pearsons at this time. So, instead she directed her course towards home, resolving to discuss the whole affair with her father, if he had returned from his business trip, as her mother had expected. She found him on the porch, reading the Sunday paper and smoking his pipe. He was a big man with a determined chin and fine dark eyes, which lighted up with joy at the sight of his daughter. "'Mary Lou!' he exclaimed, getting up out of his chair and kissing her. I was so afraid you wouldn't be home to see me. I just had to see you, Daddy, returned the girl. I need your help. Sit down, dear. Your mother tells me that you are engaged in some serious business. I feel very proud of my detective daughter. I'm afraid I'm not so good after all, she replied sadly. Now that I'm really up against a hard problem, I don't know which way to turn. I'd like to tell you about it if you have time. She seated herself in the hammock and took off her hat. It was lovely and cool on the shaded porch after the heat of the riverside streets. "'Of course I have time,' Mr. Gay assured her. "'Begin at the beginning.' "'I will, Daddy. Only, first of all, you must promise not to tell anybody. Except Mother, of course. Miss Grant seems to dread publicity of any kind.' "'Why?' "'The reason she gives is that she firmly believes some member of her own family to be guilty and wants to avoid scandal. But I think there's another—' A deeper reason. And what do you think that is, Mary Lou? A desire to keep her possession of a ruby necklace a secret. She kept it hidden in the mattress of her bed and never mentioned it to anybody except one trusted nephew. Mr. Gay wrinkled his brows. I guess you had better tell me the facts in order, dear. Mary Louise settled herself more comfortably in the hammock 
and told her story just as everything had happened. When she finally came to the description of the robbery the previous night, and of her own shameful treatment at the hands of the thief, her father cried out in resentment. "'Don't tell Mother about my being bound up and put in the closet,' she begged. "'It would worry her sick.' "'It worries me sick,' announced Mr. Gay, "'and I don't want you to spend another night in that dreadful place. "'In fact, I forbid it.' Mary Louise nodded. She had been expecting the command. "'Then may I bring Elsie Grant home with me "'while her aunt is in the hospital?' she asked. "'Yes, I suppose so, if your mother is willing.' But his consent was rather reluctant. Mary Louise sensed his distrust of the orphan. "'Daddy, do you think Elsie is guilty?' she asked immediately. I don't know what to think. You believe that your intruder was a woman, don't you? Then, if it was a woman in Miss Grant's family, how many possible suspects have you? Mary Louise checked them off on her fingers. Old Mrs. Grant, Mrs. Pearson, Corrine Pearson, and Elsie. Which are most likely to have heard about the necklace? Old Mrs. Grant and Elsie, I should say, offhand. Yes, agreed his daughter, and I'm sure Mrs. Grace Grant wouldn't steal. Besides, she's too old to get down a ladder. Hold on a minute, cautioned her father. You're not sure that your thief got away in that manner. Suppose, as you are inclined to believe, she was at Dark Cedars when you arrived last night. And suppose she hid in the closet until she thought you were asleep. When she finished her job, why couldn't she have walked down the stairs and out the door? It must unlock from the inside, while you were still locked in the closet. That's true, but wouldn't Elsie have heard her? Probably. But then she'd have been likely to hear anybody getting out of a window. Yes, I think suspicion points to the young girl, with one possible exception. You mean Corrine Pearson? No, I don't. I think the very fact that she wore a red necklace to the dance practically proves her innocence. If she even knew her aunt owned a ruby necklace, she wouldn't have done that after she was caught in another theft. Mary Louise sighed. She felt as if her visit to Miss Tracy had been wasted time, and she said as much to her father but he reassured her with the statement that real detectives make many such visits, which may seem to lead to nothing, but which all have their part in leading to the capture of the criminal. "'Then whom else do you suspect, Daddy?' she asked. "'The most obvious person of all. The person who had every reason to believe that there was something valuable hidden in Miss Grant's bed from the way the old lady guarded it. The person who made up all the stories about ghosts to throw you girls off the track. I mean Hannah, of course.' "'Hannah?' repeated Mary Louise in amazement. She had never thought of her as guilty since her interview with her that very first day. You may be right, Daddy, but if she was going to steal, why did she do it at night when we were all there? She had plenty of chance all day alone at Dark Cedars, except for William, her husband. Yes, but then you would immediately suspect her or William. This threw you off the track. Mary Louise pondered the matter seriously. I still can't believe that, Daddy. Knowing Hannah as I do, I would stake my word on the fact that both she and old Mrs. Grant are absolutely honest. Well, it may not have been a member of the family at all, observed Mr. Gay. Maybe it was an outsider, someone who had heard a rumor about the necklace and visited the house systematically at night, searching for it. That would account for the strange noises and the disturbances. It might even have been the person who owned the necklace in the first place, who would know, of course, that it was still at Dark Cedars. There is only one thing to do that I can see, and that is to notify the pawn shops and jewelers all over the country. But that would take forever, protested Mary Louise. And besides, we couldn't mention Miss Grant's name without her permission. Mr. Gay smiled. There was a great deal for Mary Louise to learn about the detective business. It wouldn't take any time at all, he said. The police have a list of all such places and a method of communication, and Miss Grant's name need not be mentioned. My name is sufficient, but I wish we could get a more accurate description of the necklace. I wish we could. I'll try to see Miss Grant again tomorrow. It doesn't make so much difference, however, her father told her. If the rubies are real, they can easily be detected. It isn't likely that many ruby necklaces are being pawned at the same time. Will you do this for me, Daddy? asked Mary Louise, rising from the hammock and opening the screen door. I just want to say hello to Mother, and then I must be on my way. I'm due back at Dark Cedars at two o'clock. Mr. Gay frowned. Must you go, dear? I don't forbid it, in broad daylight, but I don't like it. Yes, I must get my suitcase, Daddy, and bring Elsie back if she wants to come. All right, Mary Lou, I'll drive you over, 
if our dinner isn't ready, and I'll come back for you about five o'clock so that I'm sure of getting you home here safely before dark. It was a simple matter for Mary Louise to gain her mother's consent to bring Elsie Grant home with her. Believing the girl to be just a poor, downtrodden orphan, Mrs. Gay adopted a motherly, sympathetic attitude, totally unaware that both Jane Patterson and Mr. Gay suspected the girl of the crime. She was delighted that her daughter had decided to leave Dark Cedars. "'It's bad enough to have your father away on dangerous work without having to worry about you too, Mary Louise,' she said as she kissed her daughter goodbye. "'Be back in time for supper.' "'I will,' promised the girl. "'Daddy is going to drive me over and come back for me.' During the short ride in her father's car, the theft was not mentioned. If possible, Mary Louise wanted to forget it for the time being. She hated to go to Dark Cedars and eat Hannah's dinner as Elsie's guest, and all the while suspect one or the other of them of a horrible crime. Mr. Gay left Mary Louise at the hedge, and she ran up the path lightly, just like an ordinary girl visiting one of her chums for a Sunday dinner. But Elsie did not come out to meet her, and she had to knock on the door to gain admittance. In a minute or two, Hannah answered it. Hello, she said. Ain't Elsie with you? Mary Louise shook her head. No, she said she'd stay and help you, she replied. Didn't she tell you about what happened last night? No, Hannah's eyes opened wide. Was the spirits here again? Somebody was here, answered Mary Louise. Haven't you been up in Miss Grant's room? The woman shook her head. No, I ain't. I've been too busy out in the garden helping William and getting dinner ready. I figured you girls would make your own bed. Elsie always did most of the upstairs work. Well, I couldn't very easily make the first bed I slept in remarked Mary Louise, because the mattress was torn to pieces. "'Miss Maddie's?' gasped Hannah in genuine terror. She looked so frightened that Mary Louise could not believe she was acting. "'Yes. Somebody bound and gagged me, and locked me in the closet, and then proceeded to strip the bed. They must have found Miss Grant's precious necklace, for that's what it was,' John Grant said. The servant woman bowed her head. "'May the Lord have mercy on us,' she said reverently. It's his way of punishing Miss Mattie for keeping the thing her dead mother warned her again. She looked up at Mary Louise. Eat your dinner quick, she said. Then let's get out of here before the spirits come again. But where's Elsie? insisted Mary Louise, knowing that it was no use to argue with Hannah about the spirits. She went off soon after you girls left. I thought she changed her mind and went to Sunday school. She had on her green silk. And hasn't she come back all morning? demanded Mary Louise in dismay. "'Nary a sign of her.' Mary Louise groaned. This was bad news, just what she had been fearing ever since her conversations with Jane and with her father. If Elsie had run away, there could be only one reason for her going. She must be guilty. "'I had better go right home and see my father,' she said nervously. "'You set right down and eat your dinner, Miss Mary Louise,' commanded Hannah. "'You need food, and it's right here. You ain't a-goin' to take no hot walk on an empty stomach.' Besides, Elsie may come in any minute. She probably run down to show them colored people her pretty green dress. Mary Louise's eyes brightened. Abraham Lincoln Jones' family? she inquired. Yeah, Elsie's awfully fond of them. They kind of pet her up, you know. Mary Louise smiled and sat down to her dinner. The food tasted good, for it was fresh from the garden, and Hannah was an excellent cook. But all the time she was eating, she kept her eyes on the door, watching, almost praying that Elsie would come in. "'Maybe you had better not touch that room of Miss Grant's,' she cautioned Hannah. "'I think it might be better to leave it just as it is. "'For the sake of evidence. "'My clothes are in the old room now, and I'll get them from there.' "'Don't you worry,' replied the woman, with a frightened look in her eyes. "'I ain't giving no spirits no chance at me. "'I'm leaving the minute these dishes is done, and I ain't coming back day or night. "'If Elsie ain't home by the time I go, you can take the key, Miss Mary Louise, "'and turn it over to Miss Mattie.' "'Mary Louise nodded. Perhaps this was for the best. I'll leave my suitcase on the porch while I run down to see the Jones family, she said as she finished her apple pie, and you had better clear out the refrigerator and take all the food that is left, because if I find Elsie, I'll take her home with me. Maybe she's having a chicken dinner with them colored people, returned Hannah, and for the first time since Mary Louise's arrival, she smiled. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of the Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. An Alibi 
The wooden shack where the Jones family lived was picturesque in its setting among the cedar trees behind Miss Grant's home. In summertime, Mary Louise could understand living very comfortably in such a place. But, isolated as it was, and probably poorly heated, it must be terribly cold in the winter. She ran down the hill gaily, humming a tune to herself and smiling, for she did not want the colored family to think that her visit was anything but a friendly one. As she came to a clearing among the cedar trees, she saw two nicely dressed children playing outside the shack and singing at the top of their lungs. They beamed at Mary Louise genially and went on with their song. Do you children know Miss Elsie Grant? she shouted. They both nodded immediately. Sure we know her. You a friend of hers? Yes, answered Mary Louise. I've been visiting her up at her aunt's place, but she didn't come home for dinner, so I thought maybe she was here. No, ma'am, she ain't, replied the older child. Y'all want to see Ma? Yes, I should like to, if she isn't busy. Ma! yelled both children at once, and a pleasant-faced colored woman appeared at the door of the shack. Here's a friend of Miss Elsie's. The woman smiled. Come in, honey, she invited. I just wanted to ask you whether you had seen Miss Elsie this morning, said Mary Louise. Mrs. Jones opened the bright blue screen door and motioned her caller into the house. There were only two rooms in the shack, but Mary Louise could see immediately how beautifully neat they were, although the color combinations made her want to laugh out loud. A purple door curtain separated one room from the other, and some of the chairs were red plush, some brown leather, and one a bright green. But there was a mosquito netting tacked up at the windows, and the linoleum-covered floor was spotless. "'Sit down, honey,' urged the woman, and Mary Louise selected a red plush chair. She repeated her question about Elsie. "'Yes and no,' replied Mrs. Jones indefinitely. "'What do you mean by yes and no, Mrs. Jones?' inquired Mary Louise. "'I saw her, but didn't have no talk wid her,' explained the other. "'She was all dressed up in a fine dress and had a bundle under her arm. "'I reckon she was coming down to visit us, but she done go off through the woods. "'Why you ask, honey? She ain't lost, am she?' "'She didn't come back for dinner,' answered Mary Louise. "'So Hannah and I were worried.' Mrs. Jones rolled her eyes. "'Runnin' away, I reckon. Miss Grant didn't treat her good.' "'But Miss Grant isn't there. She's in the hospital.' You don't say. Yes, and I wanted to take Elsie home with me while she was away, so you wouldn't think she'd want to run away now. No, you wouldn't. Not when she's got a nice friend like you, honey. Maybe she was kidnapped. Nobody would want to kidnap Elsie Grant. She's too poor, and her aunt would never pay ransom money. Mrs. Jones chuckled. You right about that, honey, for sure. Miss Grant's the stingiest white woman ever lived. Wouldn't give away a bone to a dog if she could help herself. Served her right bout them chickens. Mary Louise turned sharply. Chickens? She repeated, trying to keep her voice calm. Yes, her chickens has been stolen all the time. Half a dozen at once it, and me and Abraham won't lift a finger to put a stop to it. You know who has been taking them? Asked Mary Louise incredulously. We knows for sure, honey, but we ain't tellin' no tales to Miss Grant. Suppose she accuses your husband suggested Mary Louise. "'Dat's something different. Den we tell. But it'd be safe enough by dat time. De gypsies has wandered off by now.' "'Gypsies?' exclaimed Mary Louise. "'Did they steal the chickens?' "'De sure did. You could see em sneaking up at night by the light of de moon. If Miss Grant ever catched them, it'd sure go right bad wid em. She hates em like pizen.' "'But you think the gypsies have gone away, Mrs. Jones?' questioned Mary Louise." I reckon so, or they'd be stealing more chickens, but we ain't seen nor heard em for several nights. Guess they done cleaned out at a neighborhood. Mary Louise cleared her throat. She wanted to ask this woman what she knew about the robbery at Dark Cedars, but she did not like to seem abrupt or suspicious, so she tried to speak casually. Since you know about the chickens being stolen, Mrs. Jones, did you happen to hear anything unusual last night at Dark Cedars? Let me see. Last night was Saturday, wasn't it? Abraham done gone to lodge meetin' and got home about ten o'clock, he said. No, I was in bed asleep, and we never wake it up at all. Why? Did anything happen up there? More chickens took? Not chickens, but something a great deal more valuable, a piece of jewelry belonging to Miss Grant. You don't say. Was there real stones in it? Genuine? Yes. The colored woman shook her head solemnly. 
Abraham always say to old lady come to trouble sure as night follows day. De mean life she's done lived, never gone to church or helping de poor. She never sent us as much as a bucket of coal for Christmas. But we don't judge her. That's de Lord's business. Did you know she kept money and jewels in her house? inquired Mary Louise. No, it war not none of our business. Abraham ain't interested in folks' money, only in their souls. He's a deacon in Riverside Colored Church, you know. Yes, I've heard him very highly spoken of, Mrs. Jones, concluded Mary Louise, rising from her chair. If you see Elsie, will you tell her to come to our house? Anybody can direct her where to find the Gay's home, in Riverside. I sure will, Miss Gay. That's a purty name, and you a purty gal. Th thanks, stammered Mary Louise in embarrassment. And goodbye, Mrs. Jones. She stepped out of the shack and waved to the children as she passed them again on her way back to Dark Cedars. Glancing at her watch as she climbed the hill, she observed that it was only half-past three. What in the world would she do to pass the time until her father came for her at five o'clock? It occurred to her, as she approached Miss Grant's house, that she might try to interview Hannah concerning her whereabouts the preceding night, and she was thankful to catch sight of the woman in the back yard talking to William, her husband. It was evident from both the old servants' attitudes that they were having an argument, and Mary Louise approached slowly, not wishing to interrupt. William Groban looked much older than his wife, although Hannah was by no means a young woman. Hadn't she claimed that she had done the house cleaning for forty years at Dark Cedars? Even if she had begun to work there in her teens, Mary Louise figured that she must be fast approaching sixty. But William looked well over seventy. He was thin and shriveled and bent. What little hair he had left was absolutely white. There could be no doubt about William's innocence in the whole affair at Dark Cedars. A frail old man like that could not have managed to handle a healthy girl like Mary Louise in the manner in which the criminal had treated her. "'There ain't no use saying another word, Hannah,' Mary Louise heard William announce stubbornly. "'I ain't a-goin' to change my mind. Duty is duty, and I always say if a man can't be faithful to his employer—' "'I've heard that before, and never mind repeating it,' snapped his wife. "'And nobody can say I ain't been faithful to Miss Mattie for all her crankiness, but we've got a little bit saved up, and we can manage to live on it with my sister Jenny, without you working here, in a place that's haunted by spirits.' The man looked up sharply. "'How long do you think four hundred dollars would keep us?' he demanded. "'Besides, it's invested for us, to bury us. You can't touch that, Hannah. No, I want me regular wages. I like good victuals.' "'So do I. But what's the use of good victuals if you're half scared of your life all the time? I'll never step inside that there house again.' William shrugged his shoulders. "'Do as you're a mind to, Hannah. You always have. And I'll go on living over to Jenny's with you, but I'm still working here in the daytime.' I couldn't let them chickens starve and the garden go to seed. And what would become of the cow? You could sell her and turn the money over to Miss Mattie. William smiled sarcastically. And have her half kill me for doing it? Not me. Besides, it wouldn't be fair to the old lady in the hospital. Depending on me as she is? No siree. Duty is duty, and I always say, Shut up! yelled Hannah in exasperation. And then, all of a sudden, she spied Mary Louise. "'Don't you ever get married, Miss Mary Louise,' she advised. "'I never seen a man that wasn't too stubborn to reason with. "'Did you find Elsie?' Mary Louise shook her head. "'No. Mrs. Jones saw her cutting across the woods this morning, but she didn't stop there. "'I guess she must have them gold pieces of her Aunt Mattie's after all, "'and took her chance to clear out when the clearing was good. "'Can't say as I blame her.' Mary Louise sighed. "'That was the logical conclusion for everybody to come to.' So I think I'll go home now, Hannah, she said. I won't wait for my father to come for me. And shall I take the key, or will William want to keep it? You take it, urged the old man. I don't want to feel responsible for it. My duty's outside the house. Hannah handed it over with a sigh of relief. I'm that glad to get rid of it. And you tell Miss Mattie that I'm living at my sister Jenny's. I'll write the address down for you, if you got your little book handy. Mary Louise gladly produced it from her pocket. This was easy getting Hannah's address without even asking for it. "'Is this where you were last night?' she inquired casually, as the woman wrote down the street a number. "'Yes, at least, except while we was at the movies. My sister Jenny made William go with us. He never thought he cared about them before. But you ought to see him laugh at Laurel and Hardy. I thought I'd die right there in the Globe Theatre. William grinned at the recollection. "'That was funny,' he agreed. "'When the show was over, I just sat there, still laughing.' They almost closed the theater on us, 
remarked Hannah. It was half past eleven when we got home, and that's late for us, even of a Saturday night. Mary Louise chuckled. She couldn't have gotten any information more easily if she had been a real detective. Yet here was a perfect alibi for Hannah. If she had been at the movies until half past eleven, she couldn't have stolen the necklace from Dark Cedars. Maybe that bit of detective work wouldn't make an impression upon her father. Of course, I can check up on it at the Globe Theater, she decided in her most professional manner. She held out her hand to Hannah. It's goodbye then, Hannah, and thank you for all the nice things you cooked for me. You're welcome, Miss Mary Louise, and if you come over to see me at my sister Jenny's, I'll make some doughnuts for you. I'll be there, promised the girl, and with a nod to William, she went around to the porch to get her suitcase. Thankful that it was not heavy, she walked slowly down the road and on to Riverside. She had plenty of chance to think as she went along, but her thoughts were not pleasant. Hannah's alibi only made Elsie's guilt seem more assured, and how she hated to have to tell her father and Jane of the girl's disappearance. There was bound to be publicity now, for the newspaper's help would have to be enlisted in the search for the missing orphan. Miss Grant would have to know the whole story, including the theft of the necklace. Mary Louise shuddered, hoping that she would not be the bearer of the evil tidings to the sick old lady. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of The Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Spreading the Net Mary Louise spied Norman Wilder's car in front of Jane Patterson's house as she turned into her own street in Riverside. A moment later she recognized both Norman and Max on her chum's porch. As soon as they, in their turn, saw her, they rushed down to the gate to meet her, and Max seized her suitcase. "'If you wouldn't be so doggone independent,' he exclaimed, "'and just let a fellow know when you needed a lift, Mary Lou. "'I'd have driven over for you.' "'That's all right, Max,' returned Mary Louise. "'As a matter of fact, Dad was coming for me at five o'clock, "'but I didn't want to wait that long. "'There was nothing to do at Dark Cedars.' "'Nothing to do?' echoed Jane. "'Are you going to stay home now and leave Elsie all alone?' "'Dad wants me home,' was all the explanation Mary Louise would make before the boys. Later, she would tell her chum about the girl's disappearance. "'I've got to go right in now,' she added. "'After I have a bath and my supper, I'll join you people.' "'After supper?' repeated Max in disgust. "'We were just considering a little picnic in the woods. It's a marvellous day for a swim.' "'Picnic? Why, we had one yesterday.' and it was such fun that we thought we'd have an encore. I'm afraid I have too much to do to be in on any picnic, answered Mary Louise, but I'll go for a walk or drive with you all after supper. Maybe. Seeing that she was firm in her resolve, the young people released her, and she hurried into her own house. Mr. Gay was standing in the living room, holding the keys to his car in his hand and trying to persuade his wife to drive over to Dark Cedars with him. Why, Mary Lou, he exclaimed in surprise. We were just getting ready to go for you. Why didn't you wait for me? And where is Elsie? inquired Mrs. Gay. Mary Louise dropped despondently into a chair. She went away, she replied briefly. Mr. Gay turned sharply. Where? he demanded. Mary Louise shook her head. I don't know. Hannah said she went out soon after Jane and I left for Sunday school this morning. And the colored woman who lives in back of Dark Cedar saw her go through the woods but she didn't come back in time for dinner, or at all before I left. "'The poor child is lost!' exclaimed Mrs. Gay sympathetically. "'If she wandered into Cooper's woods, it's no wonder.' She turned to her husband. "'Hadn't we better get out a searching party, dear, immediately? The boy and the Girl Scouts, anyhow.' Mr. Gay frowned. "'No, my dear,' he replied slowly. "'I don't think Elsie Grant is lost. Neither does Mary Lou. I'm afraid she's headed straight for Harrisburg.' and may have arrived by this time. Harrisburg, repeated Mrs. Gay. Why, that's sixty miles away. She couldn't walk that far. No, I don't expect her to walk. I think she took the train, not from Riverside, but from the next station. How could she take a train? She couldn't buy a ticket, for she hasn't any money. We are afraid, my dear, that Elsie Grant has plenty of money, though she may encounter a little difficulty in spending it since the new law was passed. We believe that she stole those gold pieces from her aunt, and last night a necklace was taken. So it looks as if she had that too. How terrible, 
exclaimed Mrs. Gay, looking at Mary Louise as if she expected her to protest, or at least explain, her father's accusation. But the girl was sitting disconsolately with her head bowed, as if she believed that every word was true. "'What shall we do, Daddy?' Mary Louise asked finally, in a hopeless tone. "'Notify the railroad stations to be on watch for a girl of Elsie's description, who probably tried to buy a ticket with a gold piece. Of course, it's possible she may have stolen some change from her aunt's pocketbook and used that for car fare. Do you happen to know what kind of dress she was wearing, Mary Lou?' "'My green silk, with the little flowers in it. I gave it to her.' The reply was almost a sob. "'I'll attend to that part, then,' announced Mr. Gay. "'And you will have to go over to see Mr. John Grant, Mary Lou, and tell him that Elsie is gone. It will be up to him to take charge of the affair.' "'Suppose he doesn't want the police notified that Elsie is missing?' asked his daughter. "'It isn't his place to decide that question. If a person is missing, it's the law's duty to step in and try to find him or her. The loss of the necklace is a different matter, which concerns the Grant family alone.' Mary Louise nodded and picked up her suitcase. She wanted to be alone in her own room. She felt too miserable to talk to anybody, even her father. What would be the use of telling him about her interview with Mrs. Jones, or the establishment of Hannah Groban's alibi? He no longer entertained any suspicions about these people. The finger of accusation pointed too surely at Elsie Grant. Taking off her hat and her dress, Mary Louise threw herself down upon the bed. How tired she was! and how discouraged. How dreadful it was to believe in somebody and to have that trust betrayed. Elsie Grant had appeared to be such a sweet, innocent person, so worthy of sympathy. It didn't seem possible that while she was accepting the girls' friendship and their gifts, she could be plotting this wicked thing. The laughter of Mary Louise's young friends rose from the porch next door and came through the open window, but the weary girl on the bed had no desire to join them. For once in her life, she felt as if she wanted to avoid Jane. She couldn't bear to tell her that her suspicions about Elsie had been as good as proved. Tired and unhappy, Mary Louise closed her eyes, and before she realized it, she was fast asleep. The experience of her previous night and the strain of this day had overpowered her, and for an hour she forgot all her troubles in a dreamless rest. Her mother wakened her by announcing that supper was on the table. Mary Louise sat up and rubbed her eyes. "'I'm sorry, mother,' she said. "'I meant to help you. "'I haven't been much use to you for the last few days.' "'That's all right, dear,' replied Mrs. Gay. "'You needed the sleep, and Freckles has been fine. "'Now come to supper.' Mary Louise was delighted to find that she felt much better after her nap, and much more cheerful. She no longer dreaded the coming necessary interview with John Grant, which she meant to seek after supper. However, she was saved the trouble of going to his house, for scarcely had the gays finished eating when John Grant arrived. Mary Louise and her father received him in the living room. "'I have a message for you, Miss Gay,' he announced. "'From my aunt.' "'Oh!' exclaimed Mary Louise. "'You were able to see her, then?' "'Late this afternoon. She seemed much better and asked the nurse to send for me, so I went over to the hospital about five o'clock.' "'Did you tell her about the necklace?' asked Mary Louise eagerly. "'Yes, I did.' I thought it would be best to get it over with. She asked me whether it was safe, and I couldn't lie, so I told her what happened last night. Mary Louise gasped. Wasn't the shock too much for her? And wasn't she just furious at me? No, she stood it quite well. She said she knew something had happened because of a dream she had last night. And she said, Tell Mary Louise not to worry, because I don't blame her, and I want to see her myself tomorrow morning. Why, that's wonderful! exclaimed the girl with a sigh of relief. I had no idea she would take it so well. Neither did I, admitted John. There's something queer about it, but maybe she'll explain tomorrow. I wasn't allowed to stay with her long today, and she was too weak to talk much. It was Mr. Gay who put the question that was trembling on Mary Louise's lips. Does she think her niece, Elsie Grant, I mean, stole the necklace? She didn't say, answered John. But I don't believe so, because she asked whether Elsie had confessed yet about the gold pieces. That wouldn't indicate that she believed her guilty of another theft. No, it wouldn't, agreed Mr. Gay. But everything points that way. I have bad news for you, Mr. Grant. Elsie has disappeared. Hm. John Grant's grunt and his nod were significant. I was afraid of that, he said. I've already notified the police, announced Mr. Gay. 
They are watching for her at the railroad stations, and I've wired the pawn shops and jewelers in Harrisburg and other cities nearby. We'll probably catch her by tonight. I hope so, sighed John. It's too bad. I feel sort of guilty about the whole thing. If we had taken the child into our home, instead of letting her go with Aunt Maddie, it would never have happened. But we were feeling the depression and didn't see how we could assume any more expense. My brother isn't earning anything, and Mother lost most of her inheritance, while Aunt Maddie, of course, had plenty. But it was a mistake. Mary Louise looked gratefully at the man. John Grant was the only person besides herself who felt any pity for Elsie. How she wished he had been able to bring her up. But it was too late now for regrets. What will be done with her when they do find her? she inquired tremulously. Will she be sent to prison if she is proved guilty? John shrugged his shoulders. That will be for Aunt Maddie to decide. But you know she has talked nothing but reform school since the child came to her. Maybe I can persuade her to give Elsie another chance, murmured Mary Louise hopefully. Maybe, agreed John, as he shook hands with Mr. Gay and departed. Mary Louise turned to her father after the man left. I have some things to tell you, Daddy, she said. Some clues I followed up this afternoon. Do you want to hear them? By all means, returned Mr. Gay. One thing I learned is that the gypsies stole those chickens. At least, the wife of the colored man who lives in back of Dark Cedars claims that they did. Mr. Gay smiled. You don't think that's important? asked Mary Louise in disappointment, for she could read his thought. It occurred to me that, if they stole the chickens, maybe it was they who stole the necklace. I'm afraid not, daughter. If we have only a colored woman's word for it, that's no proof. She's probably shielding herself, or her husband. Besides, while gypsies might steal something on the outside... They very seldom have been known to break into people's houses. Yes, I was afraid you would say that. It might be worth following up as a clue if we had nothing else to go on. But now we feel pretty sure that Elsie Grant is guilty. But did this color woman hear them last night? The gypsies, I mean. No, she didn't. It was several nights ago, and about the same time that William, the hired man, reported that the chickens were gone. What else did you learn this afternoon? inquired her father. I sounded this Mrs. Jones out about the necklace, and she had never heard of any jewels at Dark Cedars. I believe her. I don't think she could have stolen that necklace, or her husband either. I never thought they did for a minute. If the thief had been a colored person, you would have known it, I'm sure. The hands alone are different. Didn't you say that the hand that touched you was thin? Yes, almost bony. That's one reason why I didn't suspect Elsie. And how about Hannah? Did you learn her whereabouts last night? Yes, answered Mary Louise, and she told of the woman's visit with her husband and sister to the moving picture house, an alibi which the girl could easily check up on tomorrow. I hear Jane's whistle, exclaimed Mr. Gay. The young people want you, dear. You better go out with them and forget all this sad business for the rest of the evening. I think you need a little diversion. Mary Louise thought so too, and dashed off joyously to join her friends. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of The Mystery at Dark Cedars by Edith Lavelle. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Empty House Mr. Gay was seated at the telephone table in the dining room the following morning when Mary Louise came downstairs to breakfast. She waited breathlessly for the news, for she felt sure that he was talking to some of the police about the whereabouts of Elsie Grant. That's strange, she heard him say. I can hardly believe it. You checked up with the bus companies as well as the railroads? Okay, then. Keep on searching, he concluded. Replacing the receiver, he turned to his daughter. Not a trace of Elsie anywhere, he announced. Mary Louise smiled. She was almost glad that the girl had not been found. It gave her more time to believe in Elsie's innocence. Do you think she could have been kidnapped, Daddy? she inquired. People are, pretty often nowadays. But they're always rich or important returned Mr. Gay. Nope, that's one of the blessings of being poor. Nobody would kidnap Elsie Grant unless he knew that she had the ruby necklace. Then the criminal would be much more likely to steal it and let her go. That's what I think, agreed Mary Louise. What are you going to do now? There's nothing more I can do. I suppose you are planning to go over to the hospital to see Miss Grant. Yes, for a few minutes after breakfast. Then, Daddy, Mary Louise hesitated. 
She didn't want her father to laugh at her next request, but she just had to ask him. Would you be willing to go on a search with me through Cooper's woods? It's just possible that all our detective work may be wrong, and my unsuspecting mother right. Elsie might be lost in Cooper's woods. I'm not going to smile, replied her father, because I think your suggestion is a very good one. Elsie may even be guilty of the thefts, and have the necklace and the gold pieces with her, and still be lost or hiding in those woods. I'll be glad to go with you. Mary Louise's brown eyes sparkled. What a good sport her father was. Don't let's take the car, Daddy, she urged. At least, not any farther than Dark Cedars. I'd like to set out from the back of Miss Grant's yard and try to trace Elsie's steps, with Silky to help us. If I get her old calico dress and shoes and let him sniff them, I think he'd understand. Mr. Gay gazed at his daughter admiringly. Mary Lou, that is an idea, he cried. You're a better detective than I am. She blushed at the praise. Wait till we see how my plan turns out, she answered. It may lead to nothing at all. Still, we'll be having fun. It'll be a regular hiking trip. Of course it will be fun, agreed her father, for he loved the out of doors. And we'll carry blankets in case we stay overnight. What's this I hear? demanded Mrs. Gay, appearing from the kitchen with the coffee pot in her hands. What mischief are you two up to now? Only an all day hike, my dear, explained Mr. Gay calmly. You don't mind, do you? And will you drive us as far as Dark Cedars and bring the car back? Certainly, replied Mrs. Gay graciously. May I go? asked Freckles as he came into the dining room with Silky at his heels. I'm afraid you'll have to stay home and take care of your mother, son, for we may be gone overnight, replied his father. But just wait till I get my real vacation later on. We'll have a whale of a trip, all four of us together. Don't you expect to be home in time for supper? asked Mrs. Gay. That all depends upon our luck. And Mr. Gay went on to explain to his wife the nature of their excursion and the reason for making it. While he assembled the necessary equipment for the hike, Mary Louise hurried off to the hospital to see Miss Grant. It was early, but she was told that she might go up to the patient's room immediately. The old lady was expecting her. Mary Louise found her looking pale and wasted, but her black eyes beamed as brightly as ever, and she smiled faintly at her visitor. I brought you some flowers, Miss Grant, began the girl cheerfully as she handed them to the nurse, and I'm so glad to hear that you are better. Miss Grant nodded her thanks and indicated that she wanted Mary Louise to sit down in the chair beside her high white bed. Any news? she asked in a weak but eager voice. Mary Louise shook her head. Nothing more, she replied. Mr. John Grant told you about my awful experience on Saturday night, didn't he? Yes, I was afraid something like that might happen. I'm sorry, Mary Louise, and thankful that you weren't injured. You mean you're sorrier for me than for yourself? About losing the necklace? Asked the girl incredulously. This didn't sound at all like the miser she believed Miss Grant to be. Yes, I am, because somehow I never thought that necklace would do me any good. I should have been afraid to sell it for fear it would bring up some old scandal or some disgrace about my father. I don't know how he got hold of it. I was always afraid it had something to do with the gambling or a bet of some kind, but I do know that my mother never approved of his keeping it, and so I'm almost thankful it's gone. Who do you think could have taken it? Either the original owner, whoever he is, or my mother's ghost. You read of queer things like that sometimes, things that never can be explained by the living. Perhaps when we are dead we shall understand. I don't know. I dreamed about mother night before last, and in the dream I promised her to throw away the necklace. So I'm almost thankful it's gone. Mary Louise let out a sigh of relief. I'm so glad it doesn't worry you, Miss Grant. I was afraid you'd suspect Elsie. The sick woman's eyes flashed angrily. I do still suspect Elsie of taking my gold. The old expression of greed crossed her face. You haven't found it for me yet, have you, Mary Louise? No, I haven't, Miss Grant. Where is Elsie? was the next question. Mary Louise hesitated. She hated to answer this. She is... lost. She went away yesterday, Sunday morning, and hasn't come back yet. Miss Grant nodded significantly. I was expecting it. Well, you don't believe any longer that she's innocent, do you, Mary Louise? I'm still hoping, replied the girl. Miss Grant was silent for some minutes, and Mary Louise felt that it was time for her to go. But before she made a move, she told the sick woman of Hannah's decision to leave Dark Cedars, 
and she held out the key. "'But I should like to keep it for today, if you don't mind, Miss Grant,' she added, "'so I can get some clothing of Elsie's for Silky to sniff at. I want to take him down to the woods to see whether he can get on her trail.' "'Keep it as long as you want it,' agreed the old lady. "'If Hannah's gone, I shan't return to Dark Cedars very soon. John wants me to go to his house anyhow when I get out of the hospital, so I suppose I had better agree.' "'Do you want to see William about your cow in your garden?' inquired Mary Louise. "'Yes. Tell him to stop in and see me here at the hospital. And now you had better go, child. I'm very tired.' Enormously relieved that the interview had been so easy, Mary Louise left the hospital and hurried back to her home. She met Jane Patterson as she entered her own gate. "'What next?' inquired her chum, who had been told the previous evening of Elsie's disappearance. "'Still acting the detective?' "'I should say,' answered Mary Louise. "'Dad and I are going off now in search of Elsie.' "'Where are you going? Harrisburg?' "'No, Cooper's Woods. Want to come along, Jane?' The other girl shook her head. "'I don't believe so. I have a tennis date with Norman, and hope Dorsey is rounding up the crowd to drive over to a country fair tonight. She'll be furious if you don't go, and so will Max. Kenneth was expecting we'd bring Elsie Grant along.' "'I only wish we could.' sighed mary louise but maybe we shall be able to maybe we'll find her and bring her back home in time for supper and maybe not remarked jane i've got to be off now concluded the other giving her chum a hasty kiss wish me good luck you know i do was the reply mary louise ran into the house and found her father all ready to start he had made up a pack for each of them to carry his own, the heavier, included a small tent for use if they were obliged to sleep in the woods. The food and equipment were sufficient, but not overabundant, for Mr. Gay was a good camper and knew just what was necessary and what could be left at home. "'Get into your knickers, Mary Lou,' he advised, "'and bring a sweater along.' "'You don't think we'll be cold?' "'The woods are chilly at night.' "'Bring me back a bearskin,' suggested Freckles jokingly. "'I could use one.' "'I don't expect to shoot anything.' replied his father. But, of course, you never can tell. Half an hour later, Mrs. Gay drove the two adventurers over to Dark Cedars and let them out at the hedge. Mary Louise, with Silky at her heels, led the way up to the house. It is a gloomy-looking place, observed her father as he followed her through the trees. Yet it could be made very attractive. Mary Louise shuddered. Nobody would ever want to live here after all the ghost stories get around. You know how people exaggerate, and the stories are bad enough as they are. The porch certainly needs paint and repairs. It's a wonder Miss Grant hasn't fallen down and broken her neck. Mary Louise inserted her key in the lock and opened the heavy wooden door. Inside, the shutters were carefully closed, and the dark, somber house seemed almost like a tomb. The stairs creaked ominously as the two ascended them, and Mary Louise was thankful that she was not alone. After that one experience in Miss Grant's bedroom, she never knew what strange creature might rush at her from the big dark closet. "'I can hardly see where I'm going,' remarked Mr. Gay. "'You better take my hand, Mary Lou.' His daughter seized it gladly. She was only too pleased to feel its human reassuring pressure. She led the way to the rear of the second floor, up the attic steps to Elsie's room. Here they found one of the windows open, so that a subdued light brightened the attic room. But there was no sunshine, for the boughs of the cedar tree pressed against the window sill. Silky had been following them at a respectful distance, and Mary Louise lifted him up in her arms as she opened the closet door. A musty smell greeted her, but she had no difficulty in finding the clothing she wanted, and she held it close to Silky's nose. This is Elsie's, she said, just as if the dog were human. Elsie is lost, and you must find her. Still keeping the dog in her arms and the dress close to his nose, she carefully descended the stairs. "'I'd like to see Miss Grant's bedroom,' said Mr. Gay as they reached the second floor. "'I want to look at the mattress.' "'Okay, Daddy, but you go first, and have your gun ready if you open that closet door. I think that's where the ghosts live.' "'Mary Lou!' cried her father in amazement. "'You don't believe that stuff, do you?' "'I wish I did,' sighed the girl, "'because that would make Elsie innocent.' "'You are very fond of Elsie, aren't you, daughter?' "'She seems so sweet.' and all our crowd liked her. Mr. Gay went to the window of Miss Grant's room and threw open the shutter to let in the light. Just as Mary Louise had said, the mattress was literally torn to pieces. Piles of straw were heaped on the floor, and the ragged covering was strewn all over the room. 
Mr. Gay examined it, and Mary Louise walked over to the side window, the one under which William's ladder had been found. Even a piece from the mattress is on this window ledge, she remarked as she pulled out a long strip of material. She examined it more closely. Suddenly, her eyes blinked in excitement. This isn't mattress cover, Daddy, she exclaimed. It's clothing material, blue sateen, from somebody's dress. Mr. Gay reached the window in two quick steps. What do you make of that, Mary Lou? he demanded. I think it must be a piece from the thief's clothing, she cried in delight. And I don't believe it's Elsie's, unless she was wearing some old dress of her aunt's. I hope you're right, said Mr. Gay. Put the strip into your pocket. Crimes have been solved on slimmer evidence than that. He turned aside. There are no ghosts in the closet, Mary Lou, he announced solemnly. I just looked. Then let's leave, Daddy. I'm raring to go, because, well, because I have another reason now besides wanting to find Elsie. You suspect somebody definitely? he inquired. Yes, but don't ask me whom, yet. Just let's go. Still holding on to Elsie's calico dress, Mary Louise led the way out of the house and around to the backyard of Dark Cedars. Here they found William complacently working in the garden, as if nothing had ever happened to disturb the peace at Miss Grant's home. He looked up and smiled at Mary Louise. Elsie didn't come back, did she, William? asked the girl. The old man shook his head. Nope, he replied. Any more chickens stolen? Nope. Well, we're off to hunt Elsie, my father and I, explained Mary Louise. And by the way, William, Miss Grant wants you to stop in to see her at the hospital. I'll do that, agreed the man. And good luck to ye. Thanks, William, returned Mary Louise. Goodbye. She and her father walked on down the hill towards the little shack where the colored family lived, and stopped there to inquire again about Elsie. But Mrs. Jones had not seen her since the previous morning. However, she pointed out just what path the girl had taken. So Mary Louise put Silky on the trail, and the three began their search. End of chapter 17